Okay, so hopefully, first of all, <clears throat> you can see my screen, I hope. Is that right? Yeah, good. Okay. Yes. So, and uh, sorry, it's just a QA. It just came up. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to thank Walmart for, for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, my name is Nikiforos Karamanis. I'm, I'm a senior user experience designer at Temple BI, which I think is a member of Elixir as well. Um, so today I'll talk to you about the work that we do uh, at MLBI or UX Design, and specifically I'll present a case study which introduces um, what I think of the first principles of the basic um, uh, concepts around the process of UX Design uh, at EBI. Um, oops. Ah, yeah. So the word process is quite important here because this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, many people, when, when we talk about designs, a lot of people think about the artifact, the, the thing that you make, which is the design. In our case, primarily these are web, websites, but sometimes there are also things like you know, the structure of a site and things like that. Uh, however, behind this design, behind this outcome uh, or, or, or artifact thing, uh, is a process, and this is what I'm going to talk today about today. Um, and the process, broadly speaking, consists of three steps. So we have research, when we observe and interview people while they're doing the work, in order to understand their needs, what, what they're trying to accomplish. Then there is the design part, where we sit together and we try to come up with solutions to the problems that we faced, or, or ways in which we can meet their needs. Uh, and then there is a feedback um, step, which is also very important. So once you have a design, a thing that you think might help uh, people achieve their goals, you should really share it with them and see if it actually really helps them uh, with the work they're trying to do. So these are the three things, uh, uh, the three steps that uh, the design process consists of, and I'm going to talk about them uh, today. And I'm going to use an example from, from a project called Open Targets. This is the, the first uh, project that I worked on uh, at, when I joined EPI a few years ago, um, and specifically the baseline expression widget that we uh, designed for this. Um, that you don't really, I, I kind of assume that most people have some familiarity with baseline expression, but even if you don't, you don't really need to be an expert in this field. Uh, I'm using it more as an example of you know, how would approach a problem where we have to design um, um, a widget or an artifact to kind of address people's uh, needs. Um, so, as I said, the first step on UX design is research. Uh, we call this user research because what we do is we study our users. Uh, and the objective of this is to figure out who uh, the data or the information that we want to present is for, and also why do they need it? Um, so the way we do this is uh, primarily by really observing people as they work. Um, I'm, I'm talking about work because most of the times we observe scientists doing things, uh, but it could also be you know, the activity that you're interested in. So you go and sit next to them and they kind of walk you through the steps that they go uh, in order to answer the questions. And of course, this gives you the opportunity to discuss the, the broader context uh, of, of their work. And there are kind of different ways to summarize the information you get from that. Uh, one quite common one is what I'm showing here, which is called a persona. And again, with personas, there are kind of lots of different ways in which designers uh, formulate them. But I, I get that to get for to go for the simplest one, which is basically this quadrant uh, that consists from of uh, a description of, of the person that you're interested in. Uh, in this case, there is, we have a wet lab scientist uh, working on drug discovery, which we call PAT. That was a domain in open targets. Um, and you know, through the inter this is this is a summary of observations that you've done with a number of people that um, are fulfilling this role. And the objective is to try to understand their background as motivators. So they, most of the people that we work with uh, have a PhD, sometimes a postdoc as well, um, in some aspect of uh, uh, experimental biology. Um, in our case here, this is where people work in the industry. Uh, in early drug discovery. They have specific research questions, so they're interested in uh, associating targets, genes, uh, with a particular disease, or sometimes they might be looking at the disease and trying to find out, um, so they're looking at a particular gene and try to find out which disease can be associated with that. And the important thing about us here is also the behavior. So the people that we talk to uh, and observe, uh, most of the time they, they, they're in the lab um, and they kind of use, uh, obviously, the internet, they use PubMed, they use internal databases. 
Uh, but generally, they find that bioinformatics tool is a bit of a bird, and they don't want to spend a lot of time away from the actual work to try to learn how to use these tools. So this is already quite an important thing in terms of the background. Um, and then this gives you the opportunity to kind of formulate specific needs and pain, pain points. So in this project, uh, people ne needed information for various data sources. The particular question that I had is the association between a drug target and disease. But the fact that you know information is quite dispersed is kind of a general problem uh, in our area. They also need support by bioinformaticians, and they have people in these roles in their organization, but they're not readily available. They don't have a bioinformatician next to them to answer every single question that they have. So this introduces delays and frustration. Uh, then in terms of the data that we want to show, and they have questions about them. So what was the study behind them? How long ago did it happen? How valid is in general the information we try to show? Uh, and primarily, as I said, uh, because they are lab-based, effectively what they want to understand is how this information will help us help them with their experiments. So the question that they have is what experiment should I do uh, to, to in relation to the information they present, present me in this case, again, to validate the association of the disease with the target. Uh, so this already gives us kind of opportunities to think about what our system should be doing to serve these people. Uh, in a lot of the projects, not just in open targets, what we try to do is to integrate different types of information and, and enable uh, people who are not bioinformaticians to access it directly. Uh, we're focusing on answering simple queries, so the queries that I have in the beginning, which targets can be associated with Alzheimer's and which diseases can be associated with APP, are simple in the sense that can't be actually answered by our system and you don't need to be we try to do it in a way that you don't really need to be a bioinformatician to actually elicit these answers right so it has to be at the level of the web lab scientist um, uh, providing links with supporting publications is also very important because as i said they want to uh, they want to be confident that it is valid and keeping in mind that all the information we present needs to be relevant to informing their experiments. So they're not just looking at general encyclopedic information, but they're looking at information related to the task that they're trying to uh, accomplish. So one important piece of information that people are interested in is, is baseline expression. And this is basically if you have a gene, uh, specifically RNA baseline expression, uh, in which tissues this gene is expressed. Um, and one thing which is quite important, actually, in, in open targets, we didn't generate data ourselves, but we were consuming data that were generated by different resources. And again, this is quite a common uh, scenario uh, at the EBI. And the service that we relied for baseline expression is called the Expression Atlas. You, if you're working in this area, you might be familiar with it. Uh, and at that time, the way that they showed this information was like this. They had a, basically this table. Uh, the, the rows are the different experiments that people have su submitted the atlas and the columns are the different issues uh, and the important thing here is that this was a very effective uh, visualization way of displaying the data given what the atlas wanted to portray so what the, the atlas wanted to show is that they have a lot of experiments and they also have coverage across like lots of tissues uh, and this is kind of their you know their their unique point the selling point because typically one experiment will not actually have that broad coverage. So they came up with this visualization to, to exactly emphasize the broad coverage, which is kind of a, a sense of credibility behind the service. However, when we started using this in the context of open targets, we saw that wasn't really the right thing to do for our purpose, right? Um, so then uh, in UX, you sometimes try to formulate, formulate the problem we are trying to solve. In this case, I use something called the problem statement uh, from a book called Ulean UX, which looks a bit like this. So you say we have observed that a particular thing, in our case, the baseline expression widget of the target profile page on open targets is where we had uh, this information, is emitting people's user, people's goals. So this thing was not enabling users to answer the following key questions easily and quickly. And the key questions are the things that were identified from our user research by talking and observing these people. So the questions that these people had is, uh, where's the target expressed in healthy tissues? Is the target more expressed in some healthy tissues than in others? And which tissues the target is most highly expressed? So by showing this in, in this tabular format, uh, people find it was causing adverse effects. Uh, people was, were finding uh, hard to explore the widget and it was quite time consuming. Often they couldn't actually answer the questions. They felt that we're unsure, you know, is, is it like the spleen or is it the stomach? I'm not entirely sure. 
uh, by looking at the widgets. Uh, and they're describing not as useful as other styles. So they're kind of showing us things that they use for the day to break practice. And they would say, like, no, this is actually answering my question. The thing that you have here uh, doesn't. Um, and just to kind of, uh, this is, of course, a summary of the feedback that people gave us, but we had notes from the actual sessions that took place and kind of tried to link those to that just to make sure that we can go back and see the, the, the verbatim feedback, so to speak, that people have um, have given us. Uh, and then what's, one interesting thing in this template is also that it kind of prompts you to think about um, what would be the criteria that, that actually make the redesign a su su success, right? So there are things like more interaction on the actual widget once we have redesigned it, can kind of measure the clicks or generally use uh, web analytics. Uh, perhaps more downloads and sharing actions. This is one of our metrics in general for the system, how much people are actually using it for, for the various documents or uh, slide decks that they use. Um, a sense of answering their questions faster uh, and also more correctly, right? Uh, so this was often expressed with qualitative feedback as well, which is basically the opposite of what I said before. We would like people to say that it is easier and faster to answer the questions with a new widget compared to the old one. They're more confident about the answers uh, with a new widget and that it is as good or ideally better than what they are familiar with, right? Which is not happening so far. Now, uh, in the last couple of years, in Excuse DBI, me, Nick, Nick, Nick yeah. I have a question here. Uh, if sure. you will share the slides. Yeah, yeah, I'll share the slides. And I think Volmer is also recording this, so you, you'll be able to watch me again if you want. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, so I was about to say that uh, at the EBI, we moved towards using um, agile practices uh, for, for our project, and specifically we're using a, pro, um, a process called Scrum, which is an agile framework. Uh, and if you are familiar with that as well, you might be um, trying to use, you, you might have used user stories. So all the things that I talked so far, uh, the answer to who is the data for and why do you need it, you can actually summarize it in a user story. And the user story has this formula. Uh, so as a wet lab scientist working on drug discovery, here you describe your users. And in our case, this is a link to the persona that I showed before. I want to access information about the baseline expression of a target so that I can inform my experiments. Again, this is kind of a summary of the task that they want to do, get this information and the goal behind the task. So they don't want to do this because they want to inform their experiments. And um, user stories also have acceptance criteria. Uh, and in our case, these are the questions that I talked about before. So we need to design this thing in such a way that the scientists might be able, must be able to answer uh, the key questions easily quickly. And again, without trying to bore you, the questions were, where is the target expressed in health issues? Is it more expressed in some health issues than others? And in which issues the target is more highly expressed? So you can see that you can use different ways in which you can summarize what you know about your users at different levels of granularity. Oops. Yeah. So uh, another useful thing is more generic design principles that can be useful in the process. And uh, the UK government has a design service. Um, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure how many of you are based in the UK, but we have something called COP to UK where we go and, you know, kind of apply uh, for a passport where you get information about unemployment benefit and so on. Uh, so they came up with 10 principles. Uh, that they use for the design and for the development of the site. And the things that I talked about so far is the, the first and probably most important principle is to start with user needs. Um, a lot of conversations that I have, um, people who have a service or information, they come to me and they say, you know, I want to show this kind of thing. How can I do it in the best way? Um, but the way to think about this is, is what is the need that you're trying to serve, right? Is, is this is really something that your target users will be useful for. So this is the kind of thing I talk about. Uh, they also have to three more principles, do less, design details with data, and do the hard work to make it simple. So I'll talk a bit about that, and then I'll talk a bit about iteration, which is our fifth, fifth principles, because we use this. These are quite useful principles in general when you do UX design. So about doing the hard work, um, once we kind of looked into this a bit more, we had this idea, and again, not being experts in this field, um, that maybe might be useful for our target users if we just took one of these columns, so this is the tissue, and kind of try to summarize this and say, you know, for the spleen, we have a lot of expression, or, you, you know, there isn't really expression for the spleen. Uh, and again, this comes like it from, from a layman's perspective, but, but based on the feedback that we got. Uh, and when we communicated this to our colleagues in the expression atlas, where 
um, experts in this domain, they basically said, oh, this is hard. And summarizing the expression values from different studies is not trivial. So this uh, go, goes a bit into the technical uh, part of the data that we uh, work with. The method needs to be reproducible and scalable. And this is because the Atlas at that time, when I showed you this uh, widget, they had 10 rows, they had 10 experiments. But in the meantime, they actually added more. So now there are more than 30 that they have. They keep adding more. So for them, for this to be feasible, they have to be able to do it again and again and again at, at regular intervals every time they add this, uh, a study, basically. And also, as I said before, uh, this is not actually something that comes from a direct experiment, right? So the scientists themselves need to find it credible. You cannot just present them with a value and accept them to take it uh, at face value. It has to be explained. But to their credit, um, they did decide to do this hard work. Um, and they also wrote some documentation on how these values are um, generated, which, you know, our target users can go and read uh, for validation. So once we formed this agreement and we felt that uh, our research has led us in a, in a good understanding of uh, who the data is for and why do they need it, and also some ideas about how these data should be formed, and then we sat down and uh, did the design part and it is a bit like this so basically i have to admit this is pre-pandemic so now we have to do a lot of these things virtual but effectively it has to do with sketching so we take the user story and the information that we have about you, our users you can see that um we have those uh on the wall where we work and nowadays on a virtual um a virtual board and then i asked my colleagues to basically sketch how we should show this information. We also have done a bit of a review and looked at other systems and see how they present baseline expression information. So we use this again as a background. And the people in this picture, are, this is our scientific director, and these are our colleagues from, from the pharmaceutical industry who were uh, partners in this project. So they're kind of familiar with the domain uh, and they bring their own expertise as well. Um, and the objective here is to explore alternative design. So what we don't want to do in this situation is just to come up with one way of showing information to begin with. We really try to, this is called the design space, so the, the possible ways in which we can solve a problem. Uh, and sketching is kind of a generative exercise where we try to sit together and uh, I, I would include also developers who also might have insights about how the information would be displayed technically. And we try to come up with different ways uh, of um, presenting this information. So this takes like an, an hour, a couple of hours. We, we try to do a couple of iterations on paper. And then uh, if you notice these dots here, uh, I asked them to, again, think about the problem as we started and the users that we want to, to serve and basically vote the designs that they think are the most promising ones. Uh, in, within this, within this for, for this particular problem, for, for other widgets and parts of the sites that we worked on, we also included target users in this generative process. Uh, this is called, technically it's called the design studio, but you know, it, it is basically a sketching, a small sketching workshop. Um, so once we have done this, then again, we try to share that with other people in the project uh, to give us feedback. Uh, as I said, pre-COVID, the, these things used to be on the wall. We, we used to have visitors coming into our space and asking what, what we we're actually working on. So I would walk them to that and say, you know, we're actually working on the expression widget. And these are these are some ideas that we have you know what do you think about that again nowadays this happens more virtually on virtual boards but effectively it is important not just to include uh, the team that you're working with but, but also kind of try to share with the broader um organizations and and, and partners that might be interested in uh um the project of your design and um, and then uh, as I mentioned, one important thing is data, right? Particularly in our area. So we, the the first exercise that I showed, the sketching was kind of, you know, data agnostic. We didn't really think about particular genes, but of course, different genes have different expression profiles. So again, we went back to uh, our colleagues in the expression atlas, and they, they, we asked them to give us some representative um, genes uh, and kind of help us understand a bit more how this um, expression would vary. So. There is a gene called myoglobin, which is mostly uh, expressed in muscle tissue. So just getting a sample and, and kind of also testing this idea of summarizing the design uh, and the expression patterns uh, from different experiments. 
my globe is kind of probably would look a bit more like this, right? So you can see the expression in a couple of tissues and the other tissues uh, wouldn't have it. However, there's something else called the tax syndrome. I'm sorry. Mm, uh, sorry, if I could just interrupt yeah. with a question from Q&A. Um, they're just interested in how many people should be involved in the designing phase, I assume, um, to cover all of the potential needs to make sure everything's covered. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, uh, I suppose one way to ask this is how many people we should talk to before you do the design, right, to identify the, the needs. Um, this kind of varies. Uh, generally, so for, for, for Open Target specifically, actually, we, we talked to 30 people all together and they had, um, kind of, they, they were not all upside. Some of them were also managers and supervisors and some of them were kind of higher uh, executives. So I think in terms of lab scientists, maybe 20 of these people uh, were actually doing the, 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 the role that we're interested in. Uh, it is quite important to try to do this a bit iteratively. So you, they will talk, I, I would typically advise, maybe try to find like six or seven uh, and do a first, first round of interviews and then see what kind of patterns come up from that. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can discuss a bit more with them as well. Um, in terms of the design, as I said, um, the design studio typically, um, I would I would include our colleagues in the project. So our team was um, six or seven working on that. Uh, we had partners from from the industry. So again, three or four people from that. And if you can also include uh, some target users, that would be useful. As I said, for for this particular project, we didn't do it at the design phase. We did it later. But for example, we also worked with. Uh, um, genetic mutations uh, and for that we actually did have geneticists as part of the design phase so this is quite useful and I'll, I'll share uh, towards the end uh, there's a particular structure that you guys would use for this workshop so you don't really actually have to invent the process but you need to put a bit of effort in in bringing these people together and um, it's also depending again on your constraints uh, you might want to do this more than one time, right? So if, if you cannot get everybody together at the same time, maybe, maybe you can run two of these sessions, you know, first with your team and then take take some ideas and kind of uh, show them with, with um, your target users as well. So it's, it's generally quite flexible, but overall the, the important thing is UX design is not something that, you know, I myself or, or any, any designer would do just on their own. You have to include your team and ideally your, your target users. Is that all right? Um, yeah. Yes, I seem to. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was talking about the data, the fact that uh, we moved from this kind of abstract uh, sketches to actually, uh, these are called mockups or higher fidelity uh, uh, prototypes that, that actually had some data behind that. I mean, it is not something that you can click on, it's not an interactive prototype, but I was given data from the expression Atlas team and a bit of guidance. If you notice here, we kind of had this assumption that we'll show high medium and low expression uh, and try to kind of show how, um, how this would be, look like on the screen for a couple of examples. So we had you know, different, different expression profiles. Um, and at, at this point, really, again, answering the question that you, you said before, it is actually a good time to go and ask for feedback, right? So you have some designs, you can kind of study the product problem and the users, you have an idea of uh, what you would like to show. So it is time to go back. Ideally, not the same people that you interviewed, but people who have a similar role, uh, and ask them uh, if if this potentially can solve their problem. Um, the method that we use for that is called usability testing. And um, the nice thing about this, if you remember, I, I talked about the um, uh, user story in the beginning. You can basically take the user story and turn it to what we call a scenario or a context statement for, for the usability testing. So when you go and meet this person, you give them a bit of context. You say, you are a web lab scientist working on drug discovery, which they should be, right? You want to access information about the baseline expression of a target in order to inform your experiments, which is something we think they do. Uh, and um, it's just kind of contextualizes a bit uh, what you're asking them to do. And then you give them the prototype and you ask them to think aloud. So thinking aloud basically means, um, imagine you are in front of a screen, you basically, before you click a button, you basically say, you know, oh, I'm interested in finding out more about this um, tissue. I'll click on that, right? So people are, are basically um, telling you what they're looking at and what they're about to do. 
And your role then is just to watch uh, while they're using their design and, and let them drive the session. So the, the, you're trying to imagine that you know they're on their own on, on the browser or on the working environment and actually being able to use what you have given them. The interesting thing about this is that actually works also with mockups on paper. Um, you have to play the role of the computer, right? So you, you will uh, basically change from one screen to the other. In this case here, we have more like general architecture of our system and ask people to kind of uh, annotate it with their feedback, things that are missing, things that are not working or things that we find useful, useful using the um, post-it notes. But you can also do it with a single design, like the ones that I showed you before. You just ask them to explain. We ask them to explain to you what what this shows and what they would do with it. Um, later on, uh, as you move to the more highly fidelity, higher fidelity mode prototypes, obviously you can use the browser. So again, this is a session that we run uh, with one uh, lab scientist, and these are actually my colleagues from the Expression Atlas team, kind of taking note of what this person is doing. Uh, and again, our role is to observe, so we are not guiding them on how to use. Uh, our design, we're just watching their, their reactions and trying to understand whether it makes sense for them or not. Uh, and another thing that we came up with uh, in, in this project, um, as I said, there were quite a few partners outside the ABI, and they would get together once every three months for what they called integration days, which is a bit of a mini conference. Uh, the, the project had quite a lot of streams. There were experimental streams as well. Uh, so they would get together basically talk about the progress. And uh, I, I took this as an opportunity to do this usability test, but as a group. So I would take uh, some of the scientists and, and pair them with, with people in our team. And when we had the prototype test, which we had every three months, uh, I would basically ask them to, to give us feedback on that using the same method, but we're all, all kind of together. And um, this is not very common, but it worked quite well for us. And so I wrote a small description about uh, how to do that as well. Uh, and towards the end, uh, there are Generally, the way usability testing is the main method that I use, but um, once the, the system was a bit more mature, or if we had something that we're not entirely sure whether it was working well or not, because it was hadn't been tested before, again, because it came from a different service or something like that, uh, I will also use structured surveys where I would give uh, the participants of this integration days and task, and then uh, you know, they would have to kind of try to answer it and then there would be a feedback survey um, where they, they would fill in their, their uh, feedback online and then we'd go and, and look at it afterwards. Um, so in this uh, context, basically what we try to do, um, you would have perhaps a printout or even on a virtual board um, on the wall or again in, in the virtual board and then we basically annotate it with the feedback that we get. The, the red things typically are things that people are a bit unclear or they're not working very well. And the green postage are, you know, things that are, if they find useful. And the yellow ones are kind of more like observations or questions that they might have, but they're kind of not bad, not good. It's just more like things we need to keep in mind. And you try to identify patterns, right? So uh, this is actually from this, one of the services that I run where we try to cluster uh, the feedback into different themes. And of course, these, these things get into our backlog and, and inform the work that we're doing in future sprints. Uh, the important thing here is that all this is, is basically really questions to ourselves, right? So, so we're asking ourselves, are we doing the right thing? Do they, are these things helpful for our users? And we don't try to validate our designs. And we're not doing this just to prove that we have done it right, right? Uh, so there is a kind of a... Um, an article about not validating designs, but actually trying to test them. Uh, somebody asks if we did mockups for, for mobile devices at the same time as we did for desktops. Um, no, this is not something actually we do. So, and in, in fact, in a way, it's something that generally at the API we haven't looked at a lot. Uh, primarily, our assumption is that um, our users are using desktop. Uh, um, screens is kind of backed up by um, the analytics as well. But we do see, particularly from the MLBI side, we see more and more uh, mobile use. But it's not something we have actually incorporated in our process. Um, and a bit more about prototyping. So how high fidelity do paper prototypes be your experience? Uh, I'll think this might be actually my next slide, yes. So uh, 
it varies, right? It varies in this in in the steps that you are in. So when you when you start in the beginning, it's actually it's actually good to start on paper. The, the sketching part is really really important, even if you do it within your team, because it's a way for everyone to to contribute, right? So in in my experience, most people have an ability to sketch kind of relatively simple things, and also if they're not very good at sketching, it doesn't really matter because this is just a way to kind of facilitate the discussion, kind of look at the alternatives, right? So in the beginning, uh, basically, they're not very high fidelity. As you move on, as I said, once I got some example data and kind of agreed on the direction and more or less how the the, the, um, the data would be presented, uh, this is something that I did on, on a tool called Sketch, but it, it's a higher fidelity tool. Um, so you know you see they're kind of a bit more realistic this is actually the first version uh the one at the bottom here uh with the yellow uh labels uh, so this is the first version that we released on the browser and this is the version that was actually released uh on the actual service after we did the uh, you know two or three rounds of testing i think so you can see that kind of different so this kind of varies uh Something that somebody else is asking is whether there are any specific tools for online prototyping. Um, yeah, there are lots. Um, as I said, when I was working on, on this, um, I was using something called Sketch, but now a lot of people use something else called Figma. Uh, and again, I, I can kind of share this later on. Uh, but there are also these are other tools like, you know, InVision, um, lots of them. Um, so I saw a bit how how we, as I said, try to the, the objective, of course, is not just to change; it's just to improve it, right? So the the changes that we made over uh, this period were basically motivated by the feedback that we got and the, the sense that you know we're trying to make it better uh, for our users. And if you go to Open Targets today, um, it actually looks a bit different. Uh, so uh, most of the work that I I talked about uh, I've done it a few years ago because I'm not actually working in this uh, service any longer. But uh, a colleague of mine took over, and you know they, they they kept kind of getting feedback and testing the different parts of the service. So now it looks it looks different. You can see that they they changed a bit the way that they they saw the filters. Uh, they have more data as well, which is what uh, the expression team uh, promised to us, and so on. So it's kind of a process of of continuous improvement. Um, so a bit of a summary of what I have learned that hopefully might be useful for you as well. Uh, it is important to really be interested in what your users do and, and the challenges that they face. And I mention this because uh, this can be this can be challenging from two ways, right? So I, I don't have a scientific background myself, uh, and some of the things that people do are quite complex, right? So you need to maintain your focus and your your motivation, try to learn, really learn what they're trying to do. On the other hand, it happens often that if people come with a scientific background. Uh, they might assume that they actually know what their users are trying to do. And this is also a bit of a trap because unless you really do the exact work that these people are doing in, in the, this particular context in which they're in, you're probably making quite a few assumptions about what is valuable for them. So it is important to be interested really in them, not just you know the ideas that you might have, uh, and also evolve them early and often. And as I said, at any step, in this process, obviously the research cannot be done without users, but even in design and obviously in feedback, there are opportunities to involve them. Um, I I represent a, a, a stream called the Lean UX, and if you actually read the book on Lean UX, they talk a lot about experiments. They, they, they you know these small sessions that I mentioned uh, where we get feedback, they call them experiments. If you work on a scientific uh, context is actually not very productive because these are not um, hypothesis testing experiments. You know, they're not the kind of experiments that the scientists do. So what I found more useful is actually just to talk about iterating and improvement because this is quite a familiar concept, right? Before people publish their paper, they have gone through a lot of trial and error. Um, and they have actually trying to improve and iterate their process. And I, I think this kind of... Um, um, you know, it relates better to build better rapport with them. Uh, as you noticed, the methods are primarily qualitative. They, they rely a lot on being able to interact with people and sharing with them. Uh, but of course, as I said in the beginning, there are opportunities to be more quantitative. And um, I kind of only touch upon this in, the, in this, in this uh, talk. If you work with web systems, obviously there are analytics. 
And I, I wrote a small article on how we use the, the, the web analytics to actually come up with metrics for the whole platform. But you can also do it at the modular level. So as I said, for this widget, for example, we did actually record um, whether people are clicking on it and also in relation to other things on the page, because there were a couple of other uh, widgets we were showing, whether it was getting more or less attraction than, than, than before. So, you know, it's useful to, if, if you come up again, if you come up from, from a qualitative background, you know, you can apply a lot of your skills. If you come from a qualitative background, there are opportunities to, to do that as well. Uh, so there are a few questions now. Uh, which resources do you use to get back based on you know, the life science industry? <laughs> um, I'll talk about this a bit uh, later on. Uh, and how do you acknowledge to design and how to create good design for scientists? Um, in my experience, you cannot really replace an expert. So, you know, our target users are experts in what they do. I, and I don't think I'll actually be able to ever understand exactly in, in a lot of detail what they do to have to do. But it is important to identify the need. And I think the, the challenge that we face a lot, in fact, in, in, in our projects is that um, often teams come with solutions for others without actually knowing whether this is a need for the person that they want. Uh, to solve. So there is a bit of disconnect between, you know, what the service wants and what the users need. And I think this is the gap that we're trying to, to solve. I think often this is because of the thing that I mentioned before, that uh, uh, the people behind the service often assume that they know what is the right thing for the users, right? So this is kind of the, the bridge that you need to, 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 the gap that you need to bridge. The, the designer is not going to be an expert user. Uh, but I think also people in the service often believe that they know more about their users than they actually do. Um, the thing about, uh, there was a question about the, uh, of course, there are lots of questions now. <laughs> Maybe what I'm going to do, I think I have a few more uh, slides um, with a few resources. And then I think Anne and uh, Lian can help me kind of go through the questions. Is, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the resources. Um, we wrote a paper about how to design open targets. Um, it has actually a bit more detail about the early discovery part. So when we did the, the user research and, and also some of the artifacts that we used to kind of scope what the service would be about, again, based on the user needs. Uh, so this is something I would quite, I think it's relatively easy to read. You don't, you don't really have to be a US person to read this kind of things because we, we wrote, wrote it for scientists. It was published in Drug Discovery today. So this is something I would, I would uh, um, advise you to read if you're interested. Uh, I also wrote, I also found out that, um, you know, scientists kind of value papers, but I also work a lot with developers and they don't have access to the scientific li literature for, so for this group of people, I started writing LinkedIn posts. And this is basically a description of one iteration, again, going through the same steps, so specifying the goals, exploring designs with pen and paper, using sketching and getting feedback. So this kind of describes one iteration in a project where we only had um, opportunity to do it once, to do a redesign. Uh, and this was pre-pandemic, but also because we're not co-located, it kind of talks a bit about how we did it remotely. So that's another resource uh, you might find useful. Um, yeah, I remember the, the question. So the question is about uh, what do I find out about the life sciences? Um, before I joined the BI, uh, I worked in the Department of Genetics, again, in a similar project. So I, I had a bit of an idea about, about the domain. It's not, I, I didn't know a lot about drug discovery, uh, but I basically learned uh, really through, I said, through the interactions with people. And often they give you, you know, they give you papers to read or, or you know, even Wikipedia articles and things like that. So for example, gene expression, I was very familiar with, but I, I did learn enough from interacting with others. Uh, I think there are UX designers, uh, there are people from, from the life sciences who do the transition to UX design, so they, they will probably have a bit more context. Uh, this is not very common though. Most people are not in this domain. And I think if you, if you get a person like that in your team, you really need to kind of support them so that they, they learn uh, the basic things that they have to learn. So I spent a lot of time with my scientific director, for example, actually talking about the different domains, right? And we also have a community of practice called UXLS, UX for Life Scientists, Life Sciences. Uh, and what we did there is uh, we put together a description of the basic methods 
uh, that we use. So for example, we describe how to do an interview with a user. Uh, and then there are case studies, how, how this has been applied uh, by colleagues in, in, in the, most, most people in this project are from the, from the pharmaceutical industry. So they discuss how they have applied these methods in, for, for you know, the various tools that they, they, they design. This also gives me the opportunity to talk to other people about uh, the type of users that I work with and, and the challenges that they face. Some, some of them also, some projects are more like patient-based, so they're not really for scientists. So effectively, I think um, if you work in this field, you need to have the opportunity to kind of expand your the interest, but also the opportunity to expand your knowledge beyond the core UX design part. Yeah. Um, another useful resource if you're interested in this field is uh, the Nielsen Norman group site. So uh, Jacob Nielsen um, popularized usability testing, the, the way of getting feedback uh, in the 90s. And Don Norman is the person who came up with the term user experience. He was the first user experience uh, architect in Apple. And then they got together and they formed this consultancy. So this is a very rich site. It has information about almost any aspect of UX design. I would say I. I probably consulted for, for almost every project that uh, I work on, and it is free, so you can um, go and find out information about that. Um, the five design sheets, this is the method uh, for doing the sketching workshops. It's quite a structured method, and, and they give a description of how to run it, and also on their site. Um, they also discuss actually how exactly how you run the workshop, so you can basically just take that. Um, I sometimes adapt this, so this, this has five steps, but maybe we use one or two of those. But I would say in the beginning, if you want to do it for the first time, it actually gives you everything you need. So basically what you need to do is go and get the people to run it. And if you're more interested in sketching and um, the way you can use it to kind of foster collaboration in, in a team, uh, there is a book called uh, Sketching User Experiences, the workbook. So there's a book called Sketching User Experiences. This is the workbook with the practical practice, uh, which I also found quite useful. Um, another thing I would like to mention now is um, there are these collections of uh, components and patterns uh, called design systems. And actually at Temple, we came up with uh, such a design system, which we call the visual framework. We don't use this for open targets, but we use it for our own site. Uh, and you can think of this as, as kind of uh, Lego blocks. So they're kind of reusable components that you can put together in different ways to come up with different pages. Uh, and progressively, we will move more towards adopting those. I'm, I'm, I'm the manager of this design system, the product owner of this design system now. And my work actually is more around this, how to, when teams come to me, I consult them on what is the right pattern, what is the right component to use for the problem that they want to have, assuming that they actually know what their users are, which you know is, is always a difficult question to ask. Uh, and finally, uh, the example that I gave has to do with data visualization, they're also um, there are also guidelines on, on what makes a good data visualization because I did happen to look at this as part of my work. We we have a, um, a webinar at the ABI, a recorded webinar at the ABI where I kind of talk about the very basic things uh, on how to design scientific figures. So, so for example, a heat map, which is a very common uh, convention for expression data, actually has a lot of issues as, as a visualization by itself. So sometimes it's useful to kind of think about alternatives to that if, if you can. Uh, in terms of getting feedback, uh, this is really a very important activity. And I, I did do some training or I tried to introduce my colleagues at the API on how to do that. I think these are actually publicly available as well. So when I share the slides later on, you'll see that there are links um, to this introduction to usability testing and we, we recorded the session as well. And finally, as I said, uh, in Open Targets, we came up with a slightly kind of new way of getting feedback, which was as a group. So I wrote a small article on LinkedIn about that as well. Uh, I would recommend, if you're interested in feedback, getting feedback for users, try to use the traditional way of doing it, which is a one-to-one -one session. But, you know, if, if you become very adapt, you might be interested in, in kind of, uh, you know, uh, doing the kind of the, the group one as well. Um, so to conclude, and then we can come back to your questions. Uh, obviously, it is a team sport. So I'm really grateful to the people who participated in our research, design, and feedback sessions. My colleague in the in the teams that I work with in Open Targets that will develop the team that I'm on. And it is important to know that you need you need also uh, the leadership to back you, right? So a lot of these things that we did 
uh, were new for the EBI. Even today, I introduce new methods of working for, for the people I work with. So, of course, we need to have the support of uh, our leaders for doing that. So, again, I'm, I'm grateful to them. Uh, and I think we can look at your questions, which are quite a few. Uh, maybe Anne and... Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's more, you don't worry. So, uh, first question is, um, what do you do when there's a mismatch between the actual user needs and um, what you can actually do practically, like your engineering capabilities? Um, and that leads to potentially a reduction in the release scope. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so this is a very hard question to answer, and, and I think teams teams go about in different ways. Uh, but I'll tell you what what my preference would be with with the acknowledgement that this doesn't always happen in in reality, right? So, uh, it, it, I think it is very important to to have the user needs as your guide, right? And this is where I think probably this idea of doing the hard work. Uh, let me try to find it again. Uh, was important, right? So when we faced this question about the expression values, uh, we were reliant on, on on this team to basically go and do this work for us, right? And they, they could have said, well, no, you know, we, we like our widgets, that people are using it in our side, which is also true because, you know, in their side, it probably made sense. And, uh, you know, we don't want to do your work for uh, this work for you. Um, and without their help, we wouldn't have been able to actually come up with our widgets, right? Uh, so I, I think the, the the kind of um, ideally the situation should be that there is a commitment to user uh, needs and, and also you know which needs are more important than others. So this was a very important um, type of information for our side and that's why we prioritize it. And effectively you put effort uh, on this thing. There is another way to assess um, Kind of prioritize prioritize what you want to do, which has to do with risk. So, um, assuming that, for example, let's say that the whole uh, success of your system actually relied on this. You know, your system was designed to help people ask uh, answer this kind of question. Then you have to put the hard work in. You know, if it is difficult, if you have to re-engineer something, uh, your software system will fail if if you don't meet uh, these needs. So, I would say. You, you know, in a team that it is very um, driven by user needs, effectively it is these needs that guide the kind of work you're going to do. And if you find that it requires a lot of effort, you basically place this effort. Of course, this means that, you know, other things that are a bit less important, either in terms of needs or, you know, for the service itself, are not going to happen, right? Because you can put more, more effort on this kind of thing. Um, the reality now is that often you know this is not possible so as i said if these guys have not helped us in this way i wouldn't be giving this talk today right? i would be talking about something else uh, so if it is really impossible if you feel that uh, you don't have the the the, the ability to um, uh, solve your users needs i think it is still useful to go through this process a part of your selection, you know, when you put your dots or when you make the prioritization of what design you're going to make, then you have this engineering constraints as as a, as a requirement as well, right? So we, let's say that in our situation here, you know, this was our preferred design, but but the engineering team said, oh, I, I, there is no way I can do this, right? You know, it's impossible. It will take me like five years. Well, you know, we have one year for this project. We're not going to do it, right? So you select perhaps the one that they feel is a bit more feasible. It is a bit of a compromise, perhaps. Uh, but then you have opportunities to to check it, right? So if, if you go further down on the feedback session, actually, it might be the case that this is good enough for your users. Uh, so you don't really know it from the beginning. But I, I think, I, ideally, it's better not to compromise on the need, but you can compromise a bit more on the delivery of, of what you're trying to, to, to make, if, if this makes sense. Yeah. Good. We have a couple of questions in this one theme about cost. So UX work is a lot of work and it gives a lot of good results, but it is also an effort that takes uh, time and, and cost. So do you have any guidance on, on how to consider how much is worth doing? Um, 
I don't see it here, but I would like to add it might also be depending on how many users will use this product and uh, for how long it will be used or yeah, any guidance in this cost. Yeah, I mean, every, to some extent, every question is, is kind of unique. So the, 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 um, the project that I talked about and mostly most things that I'm involved in, uh, typically they, they, there is a good number of people that might be using that. And also they are strategically important for the organization. So for example, Open Target was a collaboration with um, pharmaceutical industry. We wanted to highlight that we actually have useful things for them. And there was an understanding that it needs to be, you know, usable, not just usable actually, you know, it needs to be a good experience for, for our users, right? Uh, so therefore, uh, first of all, they created a position for somebody to go and work with this. There was, as I said, a lot of support for the leadership. Um, and effectively, we, we, you know, we had budget and things. Uh, what, what sometimes what happens is we might not, you might have a budget for a UX person. You might not really have ways to reach out to your users because this also uh, requires resources, right? And then often, in many cases, you also need to pay them as well. Uh, in, in this context, I didn't because uh, people in the pharmaceutical industry they, they are not you're not supposed to pay them for anything. It would be considered to be a bribe. But for other contexts. Uh, projects, for example, the redesign of our website. And um, when we ask people for feedback, we need to give them something because, you know, they're not going to give 45 minutes of time always for nothing. So um, I think it is a balance. Uh, uh, ideally, my vision would be to be able to support every team at the EBI, but, but practically we cannot do this because we're not that many people. So the, we tend to focus more, as I said, in, in the projects that um, are a bit more strategic and, and also you know, more, might have more impact, perhaps based on the user base. However, um, the design systems that I said, and this is one of the reasons why we shifted our focus a bit more on this. Uh, so the design system is a collection of components that are definitions of, uh, you know, the button or or how actually a page should look like. Um, and that's why we're developing this because this allows other teams that might not have and a UX resource to at least get some building blocks from, from scratch. And of course, it's not the only design system. So, you know, there are lots of them around. Uh, and sometimes this is kind of a good starting point, right? So if, if, you, if you don't, if what you're doing might not impact so many users, or if you want to find some good defaults, which I think actually is what we put here, yeah. Uh, maybe looking at the design system and trying to kind of use components that have already been developed could be a solution. Yeah. Maybe a follow-up question on that. And yeah, what mm -hmm. have this is, uh, what is the the product owner's role in this since you're working in an agile in UX manner? Um, what yeah, do they so... decide? Yeah, that's, that's so yes, we, we do have a product owner. I mean, it's not the same product owner for, for every project. Uh, and exactly, we try to work on the uh, on the basis that it is the product owner's decision, uh, basically how we, we go about and what we're going to ship at, uh, at every given uh, point. I'm the product owner of the visual framework of our design system, so basically it's my role to, to make sure that this is of good quality. But for other projects, the open targets or the website, you know, there are other people acting at this, and the, my role is to just kind of consult them. So the, I think it is important for the product owners to to be familiar with user needs. And this is the kind of information that we try to feed them. Often they might take part on, on the actual research. Uh, but at the end of the day, in, in the Scrum context, you know, they they decide. So our role is to consult and they decide on, on um, the direction we're going to take. Uh, however, part of this is also to try to involve other people as well. So I think we, we recognize the product owner as a person who is responsible for making the decision, but I try not to have them to make the decision in isolation because, as I said, we need to involve the whole team uh, when we explore the designs. So it's kind of a collaborative process, but it is important for somebody to actually have the role of the product owner because you know you know that they are responsible for that, and, and then you have to accept. Thank you. Yeah, we have about two minutes left, and a couple, probably more questions than can be answered in that time. So. Um, Maybe we can try and squeeze squeeze one of them in and then um, see if we can answer the others uh, out of the meeting. But 
the one that's got the most uh, interest, I guess, and follow up is if the designers don't have uh, constant contact with the final user, but just with other experts in the UX design field, for example, um, how does the designer kind of make sure that they have sufficient contact, that they have enough um, to know that they're doing what their users need them to do? Like, how do you ensure that happens? Yeah, so as a, um, I think one of the challenges that we face at EBI as well is that, in fact, uh, often there is no direct contact with users. I, I believe if you are in the situation as a UX designer, I think what you need to do is if, is to push for for the team to actually really go in and try to meet these people. Uh, of course, this you know sometimes there are constraints. As I said, they might not have the budget. You know, they might not even know who their users are. And um, I I work with the intent of of being able to achieve that. In the meantime, they're often uh, kind of proxies, as you say. So there might be somebody in the team, as I said before, who, who actually has done this work before. So you might go and ask them for information, right? Uh, there's also a lot of feedback that we get from support. And this gives you an, an idea of, of uh, you know, where the issues might be. But I think fundamentally, uh, a dedicated UX person, a person who has actually been hired to do the UX work, I think for me, they have this responsibility to try to move the team towards uh, meeting more of the users, right? And I, I described the context here where this was actually set up for us, uh, although we have to ask for it, right? It's, it's not like when, when I joined Open Targets, it's not that they were expecting me to do all these kind of things, but uh, they were very supportive and we had users to talk to. So I think ideally your role, if you have a UX capacity or if you are kind of a hidden UX person, is really to move your team towards this situation where they have more direct contact with users. In the meantime, you can use proxies and, and kind of existing feedback as well. The other thing that I find a lot is that, you know, teams have actually feedback, but they don't, they don't, sometimes they don't know how to use it very well. So reviewing that is also quite important because it might give you, you know, if somebody gave a support request, this could be actually the user whom you can interview to find out what they do, right? So you can start with that as well. All right, so we are on the hour, more or less. Uh, so I would just like to thank you, Nikki Forrest, for, for uh, doing this for us. I will collect all the questions from the Q&A and put that into some sort of document. And I will also collect the links that you have uh, uh, provided here in the presentation, as well as the slides, uh, and make sure that the, everyone who registered for the event gets the uh, both the links to, to these uh, slides and, and things and the recording uh, from from the webinar here. Thank you. Very much. So I'll, I'll send you the I'll send you the link to the slides and then the slides have the links to you know the other things that I I, I mentioned here like the visual framework and so on. Um, feel free to share the document with me and I'll, I'll kind of try to type uh, some of the answers there for the people who unfortunately we weren't we were not able to discuss it today. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me to that, and I, I hope you found it useful as well.